Hi, everybody. I'm Bernard Schwartz. I'm the director of the 92nd Streetwise Unterberg Poetry Center, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this conversation between Tessa Hadley and Cullum Tobin on the occasion of the publication of Miss Hadley's new novel, Free Love. Uh, the writers will be in conversation for about an hour, and the conversation will also feature a couple of short readings from the book. Um, such a nice crowd today. I just wanted to plug some of the other upcoming spring events. Uh, some are in person, uh, some are online. Um, we will be featuring an event on March 7th called Playing Othello with three actors who've recently played Othello either in New York or in London, uh, discussing the play reading passages. And um, then on March 16th, the South African novelist Damon Galgut will be in New York, we hope. Um, reading from his Booker Prize winning novel, The Promise. And then later on in the spring, we'll feature events with the likes of Jennifer Egan and Don Lee, uh, Hilary Mantel, and uh, Maxine Hong Kingston. You can check out the full lineup of events at 92i.org slash readings. Uh, we hope you enjoy tonight's conversation and I'll turn it over to Tessa and Colm. Welcome. Thank you very much. Hey, Tessa, it's great to see you. Um, Lovely to see you. I want to start just by asking, um, what, what's strange here is how close 1967 is to the Second World War, mm. in, in that you can have characters who really have had their lives transformed and really, really came of age in those yeah. years and are affected physically, morally, and also, of course, the, the sort of funny sexual freedom that people had during the war has, mm. I think, really matters to this book. Yeah, I, I I was born in 1956, and I, I remember when you're a child, that war seemed infinitely behind and yet omnipresent. People talked about it. And it, and it was as time passed, I suddenly realised it, it was like, you know, the day before I was born, that, that war was there. It was actually so close. So looking back and making my story happen in that decade, I, I was intensely aware that the people who'd been in the thick of that war were still young, really. And there it is. And, and yes, the book is in some ways about the license of the 1960s, but how much huger in one sense the license of, of the crazy, appalling chaos of war has been just, just round the corner, just behind their backs. And that legacy is still playing out. Yes, and there's a sense also that those those places that the uh, such, for example, Cairo, or even mm. even references mm. to you know Iran, Afghanistan, that that those that the empire in in a yeah. way could affect people's lives because you could always find work doing yeah. something, you know, in those countries, which again would make a difference romantically to who you could meet and what you could do. Yeah, yeah, that that bit of Britishness which is so thoroughly over now though sometimes one wonders if our politicians thoroughly know that but it's finished but that wasn't it took a long time even as empire technically officially wound up that British expansion into all those places and the sense that our story ran arrogantly and with, with all that privilege and blindness around the world that that lingered a long a long time yes it did and 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 you're quite right it, it offers all these opportunities for for play and risk that are not there at home and you know that that goes I mean I can remember that those places being resonant in my childhood and then of course there was always South Africa where where that story lingered even longer and I can remember all those white South Africans coming back much later in, in the 80s and the 90s with a sense of such diminishment and from Zimbabwe as well, diminishment. Suddenly you were going to be stuck back in what you'd vaguely thought of as the mother country or the home country, but it was so teeny and so grey and so damp. And you, you'd been in these, this, these huge places with their vista onto the world with all the excitement that that brought for those... Lucky ones, I don't, yeah, lucky, I suppose. It's, and you have, um, there's, a, there's a phrase I came across where I hadn't thought of it for years, and it was on everyone's lips in 1967 and 68, which was the Unilateral Declaration of Independence and yeah. Ian Smith. 
And it was it was lovely because it really gave everyone, no matter who you were, something to be against that you could <laughs> march exactly. against, could be against it. Ian Smith. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It is as you grow older. It is funny how how the attitudes, which at the time, I mean, all my parents' attitudes, just seem sort of inevitable and judicious and tr truthful, become part of history. I mean, I, I can remember certainly their outrage against Ian Smith, which actually, as you say, was almost convenient because everybody was against him. But here's a funny thing. My parents were not, they were socialists, but they weren't intensely political. But I can remember so often, on the news something would come on the telly and my my mum and dad would say oh well don't believe that that's just american propaganda no the russians have a and and they were carelessly idly pro-russian and anti-american now isn't that a piece of cultural history that we've forgotten now that people who were just about labor party voters really that they had that sort of tough prejudice against america actually much of it very misguided certainly on the russian side anyway and did you feel at the beginning that you knew this period? I mean, we're talking about 1967 and mm. 68, specifically in London. Did mm. you feel you knew this period and then did you discover that you didn't? I, I, something like that. I mean, it's funny, isn't it? Because actually you and I are pretty much, a, we're, we're of an age. We were there. We didn't. You can't as a child grasp the big overarching themes and the the. You can't grasp any context because you don't know what came before. Not really. You, you have intimations of what came before. Um, but what you do is you soak up the material detail with, with a thoroughness and a, a kind of hunger and appetite that, that the adults don't. So I can remember lots and lots about our childhood homes and furniture, which my mum can't remember. Um, so that that does a very good work for you, actually, when you're reconstructing the time. So I, I didn't, I did feel as if I did know it, in fact, although I then, as I acknowledge at the end of the novel, I, I, someone put in my hands this wonderful compendium by Jonathan Green, which was put together a day in the life, put together in the 80s, I think, which was people who were there in, in counterculture London in the 60s, reminiscing about it some of them with fond nostalgia some of them with contempt and that was a wonderful that was the other part I needed I needed yes. to know how it felt at the time to, to grown-up people so yes. that that was you, invaluable could you take us through uh, the hill and the grove uh, and that that little detail yeah. I stole from there and they're they're pretty much the, it's the fact that the one the white inhabitants of the same London area call it the hill and the black inhabitants if, but I'm not absolutely sure I've got that the right way around now. Isn't it the other way around that Notting Hill is the black um, name and West Brown Grove is the white, is the white name. name. Is that, yeah. is that yeah. possible? I, I think that's that sounds right that sounds right yeah and and what a crazy thing but what a but but not crazy at all of course because they're layered in those streets are so many different pieces of history and pieces of culture. And, and it is a moment of authentic coexistence, most definitely. But, you know, on the other hand, on the other hand, there are huge blanks of incomprehension and mismatch between all those groupings of people who live there. And it's not just black and white. It was a Jewish area. Um, it was, there were Irish, there, you know, everybody was mixed up there together. It was, and that, that was, that was an exciting thing to be part of, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think you're catching it in, in, at a moment of excitement, obviously, because people are wearing different clothes and people are leaving mm. home and uh, people are listening to different music. Mm. But there's also the sense of London being recreated um, mm. as, as a novel is happening. And there was there's a sudden moment where you mentioned the West Way. You realize, yeah. Oh, you mean it wasn't there, and then yeah. you know. So if you could just take it, if you could just take us really through what, just for people who don't know Notting Hill now yeah. or then, and who don't know Westburn Grove, if you could just take us through where they are and what they meant in 1967 and 68. Well, they were they were areas of West London which had originally they are grand actually. Those are grand, rather handsome streets mostly. Um, and then they've fallen on bad times and they've become poor. And those big old tall fronted houses 
have been subdivided infinitely into flats and uh, bedsits. And then that becomes, I mean, it's, it was a student area. I didn't mention the students. There are a lot of students in London, even in those days when only whatever it was, six or 7% of the population went to university. A lot of them were actually living there. And then all these layers of immigration and sort of groupings of Londoners moving through as rents are cheap. So, and then at, in the 60s, there is one of the horrendous great, destructive road building projects purportedly to solve traffic problems in London but of course it's well known that all road building projects just get new cars on the road and the problem is still there that that cuts a swathe through the area and as soon as I knew that as soon as I understood that I mean I've seen the west way it's horrible when you come out of Labrook Grove tube station there's this great beast of a motorway bridge effectively cutting across your eyes just outside it it's horrendously ugly um as soon as I realized when that was built that it was built right in the middle of my middle of my period I I knew it would be in the book and that you would feel something being demolished and being replaced by a new London so in a way you can feel the London that follows my moment of mix up and counterculture and fluid openness a sort of demolition site in a way you know something else is coming which is the the, the successive decades afterwards where where money starts to come back into london and i mean the population of london is actually really low in the 70s and 80s compared to what it is now it's depopulated i i think i'm right in this i'm, I'm not a demographer obviously but i think i'm right that it loses 2 million post-war and then it floods again with with population and with wealth and um now Notting Hill and Labrook Grove are extremely desirable addresses and you'll be very lucky to be able to buy a flat there I, I do quite like thinking that at the end of my novel Phyllis who sort of committed herself to not having anything and living in this bohemian freedom will actually be the owner of two flats that if she's still alive now will be very fine real estate um, she doesn't think like that she Phyllis. doesn't think like um, that at all it hasn't cr- it hasn't crossed anybody's mind to be honest what, what's 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 tremendous about the book is her transformation in that she really is a most innocent person yeah that she's living in the suburbs really without any political awareness um, looking mm. after her domestic duties loving her son more than her daughter but you know being being good in every possible way and um, but it, but it, it makes it very easy then to move her because it yeah. isn't as though she has. I think she steps lightly on the earth. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And th- that's part of the reason why I needed to have her daughter in there, because I didn't want Phyllis to be a whole heroine. She's. I, I, I sort of want the reader, though not all readers do, but I want the reader to be with her. And, and think that she's got this wonderful openness, or as you've beautifully put it, that she steps lightly and she's, she's changeable and she can find a new way of being and a new shape of being. But I also need someone in the book who'll say, oh, my God, what does she think she's doing now? You know, she, she's so stupid about things. She is such an innocent. And, and innocence is both magnificent and it can change the world. You know, I'm not making this comparison with... Joan of Arc, but you know, it's people, girls like Joan of Arc changed the world in their innocence, their foolish, mad, insane innocence. So no, Phyllis is not her, but her innocence is magnificent, but it's also a bit terrifying. And if, if, if you can see more acutely than her, as her husband can and her daughter can, she, she can look very foolish. That's a great thing about the novel, isn't it? Uh, the novel form, I mean, about novels. You can just have all these different angles. Yeah. Yeah. on what's going on. Um, unusually, what, you, what you're doing, just say in the last three books, is taking, uh, I suppose, a situation, a problem. What if all the family in the past, in, in your novel, The Past, what if all the family went back again for, for a month or longer to go back to the old family house and they're all grown up now, they've all moved away, but for once they're going to be together for this period. And then the novel unfolds. And then in, um, in, in your novel, so I'm going to get, oh my God, I'm going to, yes, later in the day, where you simply say, what if uh, somebody died suddenly in a very closely knit group of two mm. couples? What if mm. one of them died? 
what would then happen to mm -hmm. the other couple, to the widow, to the children? Just you start with an event. You start with what if, yeah. and in this case, what if somebody in the suburbs yeah. of London in this year, 1967, this year of grace, as it were, decided actually, I'm going. Yeah, I, I, I'm leaving. What would happen next what to happen? everyone, to the two children, to everyone involved? Yeah. And it's, that's what novels do, don't they? They sort of they drop some new chemical into a bowl of material that is that is given a group, a cast in a play, and then and then and then you it has the room, the spaciousness. That's what's lovely about the form to watch everything that follows on from there. And um, there, there, there is actually a book of, um, a, a sort of, I suppose it's a book about psychiatrists, written by a psychiatrist. It's called Women Who Leave. And it's about the phenomenon um, of mothers who just yeah. simply go to the doll's house. And yeah. it obviously, he, we come across it, I think, quite graphically in the autobiographical writing of Doris Lessing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, of somebody who just decides, actually, I, I must go. I, the, yeah. Nothing will happen unless I go. Yeah. And, so that, um, but what, what's interesting in your book is that you're not, that yes, it, we, we can see it from a feminist perspective, but she doesn't. No, no, she doesn't. She doesn't. She, she, I don't, interesting to think, what, what is she following? I mean, I think one of her motivations is, is an oblique one, but it's incredibly powerful, which is the impending loss of her little boy, which is going to happen to her whether she stays or goes. If she stays at home, he is going to be taken away to boarding school. And Phyllis is extremely inarticulate about this crime, if you like. She accepts it as part of that old world, the suburban, respectable, bourgeois world, that little boys must go away to boarding school and they must be weaned off their mothers. But in her inchoate inner self, she feels this is a crime that is happening because that little boy is actually the person she's loved most in all her life. She's in love with him, besotted by him, and he's going to be taken away from her. And he's actually asking to be taken away from her. And she thinks that is as it should be. But something in her rebels against that so violently that it isn't a coincidence. It's not meant to be a coincidence when she then along comes a young man out of the blue and she attaches to him instead as a sort of alternative so there's some of that which which isn't which isn't much to do with freedom or feminism or anything it's just as it's it's greed for life I mean I think that's what she has and, and that's another element of, of it of course is that she actually hasn't had much passion in her life that and we learn eventually that there was some incident in her past which was a sort of cauterizing horrible rape really although she doesn't call it that and that perhaps that's been what lay behind her, her rather companionable and not passionate marriage. And, and actually, whatever she is, she is a woman of strong appetites, passionate appetites. And then again, here comes this young man who is offering all of that to her. And she has that terrifying moment. And it happens in about 10 minutes, where suddenly for the first time, as, as you do at some point in your 40s, or 50s, whenever, different for men than for women, I think. You think, I'm going to grow old, I'm growing old, it's done, it's over. And, and she has it like in 10 minutes. And then it's in that 10 minutes of, of everything being torn open that it just so happens, Nikki, the young man is there and he chooses rather randomly and idly to kiss her and from that everything flows but you're, you're right there's no she's not a feminist it's Colette who's going to sort of be a sort of feminist later. Could you read us something from the book? Yes in fact I, I the bit I picked to read first is it's not about perhaps I should have read about Phyllis's kiss but here instead is the boy she kisses a boy I call him he's about 25 I think I'm remembering that right of course. You, you know how you hold on to all their ages and their dates of birth in the back of your notebook for, the, for as long as you're writing the novel. And then, of course, why would you need to anymore? Uh, so this is about Nicky. And this is before Nicky arrives at their house. He has actually met Phyllis and her husband, Roger, before. But as a child, he was a child. He can't really remember it at all. So this is him preparing to meet yeah. the woman can, who is going to. Can I just explain? Can I just explain for a minute? 
Um, his arrival is quite dramatic because um, the house is terribly neat and tidy and everyone speaks in a, in a very careful way. And everything's very organized. You know, father goes to work every day in the foreign office, mother stays home, there are people to clean, there are two children. And suddenly in the middle of all this, this big untidy fellow arrives and he has some awful opinions left wing and he wants to argue with everybody. But he, he's beautiful, but in a way that is so untrained that all of them, he disrupts the peace of the household even before the sexual thing begins. I mean, in other words, yeah. Colette, the daughter, wears the wrong dress. The father feels that he's this fuddy-duddy opinions and this, but this young, this youth, but it isn't just youth. It's, it's a, it's, it's really, really is, and not exactly yeah. smelly, but he is very untidy. It's all but. And yes, so, I wouldn't, I would doubt whether he's really washed much in that shed. Yes, exactly. Bathroom. So that, yeah. that, that sense of this clever, brilliant yeah. unwashed youth has arrived yeah. and yeah. that is hugely disruptive um in the house sorry yeah. I, just, I just just explain no, that's lovely that's so lovely that you felt that's just how i wanted it to read and in fact later on it's i i remember when she pursues him to his room he answers the door he's not expecting her and and he's in an awful old dressing gown with bent glasses and terrible slippers and she has the thought that if he weren't young and beautiful he would look awful and there is just that wonderful precarious moment of youth when you can be unwashed unkempt wear terrible old stuff live in a tip and you and your youth burns like a flame and then the the real trick is to not go on like that till you're 40 <laughs> it just stops working so anyway this is Nikki just before he it's the first time we meet him Nicky Knight was over an hour late for dinner with some old friends of his parents who were probably appallingly dreary. He had no memory of these people from the past and couldn't think why he'd agreed to this visit. Was he supposed to get something out of them? But the husband was at the foreign office full of fascists and colonial types. Surely even his own fond mother couldn't believe that her son's future lay in that direction. Nicky imagined complacently that there was a file on him in MI5 and that this file must be thick by now with reasons a foreign office career was unlikely. The suburban train out to Ottilie, trundling between the tamed, meek housebacks and allotments, crowded with commuters sweating in their suits, barricaded behind their newspapers, had so filled him with flatness and despair that as soon as he'd got off it, he'd fallen into the nearest pub where he was on his second pint. Nicky was almost unrecognisable from the unappealing child he'd been when Phyllis Fisher met him years ago. He'd never quite convincingly looked childish. His long nose, full lower lip and dense eyelashes had seemed exaggerated in a little boy, and his ears too had been comically adult-sized, a significant item among his humiliations at school where he was known as Fat Bat. He had been plump then with a mop of curls. But now he was long and thin, and his ungainliness answered perfectly to the style of the times. His black curls had grown out straight and his hair hung down well past his collar so that it was his habitual gesture, almost a tick, to shake it back, raking through it with nicotine-stained fingers, pushing it out of his short-sighted eyes. His glasses were delicately gold-rimmed. The flesh was thick under his eyes and his nose was distinctively crooked, nostrils flared like a thoroughbred. His face seemed marked already with efforts of thought. In concession to the occasion of dinner with the fishers, he had put on a not quite clean white shirt and a navy blazer with brass buttons his mother had bought for him, which he wore in a spirit of military parody. No tie, partly because ties symbolized a conformity he despised, and partly because he'd never mastered tying one. At school, he'd anxiously preserved the pre-tied noose at the end of each day, slipped it over his head again each morning. If ever he pulled out the knot by accident, he went with it shamefacedly to Matron. Um, one of the things you do very well is establish a character and then make the character more subtle and more nuanced and, and, and of course, more interesting. And it is, um, in the case of Nikki and Roger, who is, works in the Foreign Office, it, it looks as though Nikki's gonna be the sort of parody, 
I mean, well, it would be so easy to make a sort of left wing figure on with placards, marching, you know, writing for the radical press. And that Roger in the Foreign Office would be a very conservative old fellow who really, you know, had settled down into a sort of funny Toryism um, that, uh, you know, that he re- he would read the Daily Telegraph or something. Mm. And, and you don't do that. Um, mm. That's it's fascinating how you build them. In other words, we're, we're actually watching Nicky becoming quite an interesting journalist. When, when he goes to a demonstration and he watches what's happening, yeah. he actually is able to see the forces at work and he's, he wants to describe them honestly and seriously. So that yeah. it is, so he's, 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 he isn't merely a sort of left-wing youth, sort of pimply and um, oddly attractive, but, but quite, you know, part of the age in that there was so much... Yeah of that sort of mindless, radical, hippie dumb thing going on. He isn't that. No, no. Well, it would it would be boring, wouldn't it, as a writer or as a reader, to, to, to have people merely be their stereotypes through the length of a long book. So, so and, and of course, I, in fact, Roger, who is working at the Foreign Office, it's 1967, this Labour government in power, the British government have just declined to go to, not just, but they've declined to go to war in Vietnam in support of the Americans, though they were asked. This is, he, and and uh, Roger has come out of his war where he actually was a hero. Whatever that is, whatever it means, he was brave. He, he looked it in the eye. We get the feeling he doesn't go on about it ever. You know, and uh, yeah, he's, he, every generation, has its clear thinkers, and he has been one for his generation. And that's why we feel it painfully when in this new moment of 1967, he knows that he and his sort are being trampled upon and left behind with with all the the hard-won lessons they have. And, And I hope we feel for him, feeling that the things he's learned are being made worthless. But at the same time, we we can we also there's, ha, it's a complicated one. You know, we also have the feeling that the status quo is perpetually wrong and unfair and needs renewal. There's something Cheshwav Milos says somewhere like, thank God for the hand, guns in the hands of adolescents. I'm not quite sure how wholeheartedly I feel that, but one's got to feel it sometimes, occasionally, some of the time. Things need renewal. And th- there's a moment in the middle of the book when, if you like, Phyllis follows up her, her sexual awakening with a political awakening. Nikki casually, out of, out of the small change of his left-wing ideas, throws a few things, uh, remarks at her about her husband's work. And for the first time, she takes that in and she won't even come to bed. She sits up and it's cold in the room and he's asleep and she... This is a point when her innocence, I, I want us to actually feel that that woman is at the, the limit of what she can do in terms of thinking through things she's denied to herself and genuinely thinking the world, I could look at the world differently. Perhaps the people in charge are not wise and to be trusted. They're terrifying and what's done in their name is appalling. And she genuinely thinks that, and and it genuinely changes her. Every cell in her body, as she says somewhere, I'm, I can't go back to what I was before. And then Roger says, you live in the same world as me. You can't step out of it. You're part of it just as I am. And she says, no, I'm not. I'm different. Every bit of me has changed. I can't come back. And again, I think you have two opposed truths there. But that moment is is meant to be real in the book. And in a funny way, it's meant to be more real for silly Phyllis, genuinely, painfully thinking a new truth than it is for Nicky, for whom those things are just inevitable for his generation and his intellectual caste. Yeah, I mean, mean, listening to you and and, uh, reading the book um, makes me think, I know this sounds stupid, but makes me think, what an intelligent novelist you are. That that's as you're reading your novels, as, as I'm reading your novels, I'm watching an intelligence at work, which is, is fascinated by sensuousness, by the body, by sex, by the allure of other people. But all the time you're working, 
towards making the characters more textured, making their responses to life more exact in one way, but also, I think, more ambiguous. And I think in the creation of these two men, you, you, you really put, I, but what I'm enjoying is a sort of the way you put thought into this. The, 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 the way somebody placed in the, the, the way somebody placed in these years is not simply a cipher of the ways different forces were at work in these years, but is given a sort of dense personal life uh, that, that they are themselves before they stand for any sort of force at work in 1967 or 68. And I think in the case of both Nikki and I'm mean, just, just, just sticking to the men for the moment, uh, but, but also even, even Hugh. Uh, um, mm. who's the son, mm. that his response to his mother's departure is black. Mm. That's an incredibly dangerous thing to do in a novel, just say, like, he just doesn't want to know. In other words, the yeah. pain is so intense, the shock is so enormous, that what he does is he closes emotionally. And you realise that, that there isn't any way to get through to him now. He's not actually going to, I mean, he's obviously going to show his distress because he's going to tell them in school his mother's dead. He's asthma is going to begin, you know, but, but it isn't as though you're going to give him a great rich inner life at this period, which his sister will have because she's older. Mm -hmm. But that decision, for example, with Hugh, not to go into, uh, you know, like, mm -hmm. yes, he has a stamp collection. Yes, you, you can actually, by not dramatizing his pain, you give us a sense of it that is so sharp and real when he comes back from boarding school, that Christmas when he looks into his stocking, his mother's not there. Yeah. That, that is, that it's, it's a very intelligent response. I mean, I just love watching you at work. See, what's she going to do with him now? And what's, what's fascinating is you say very little, actually. She's going to leave it. She's going to leave us to imagine him, giving us enough information to do so. Do you know, I actually have somewhere in the back of the notebook, I've scribbled to myself early on, I could make Hugh change his mind. And then underneath, I've just written, no, no, he doesn't. You know, I, I could have made him open as well. And I, but I didn't think that boy would have. I mean, I think the traumas of going to school and his mother's departure. And I actually think, funnily enough, and I think Colette, the daughter, thinks something like this too. Being a man, he takes it, it's harder it hits him harder because he has to be that man gathering everything together, holding onto it in control. It's her. And there's a moment when Colette's almost thinking, oh, why aren't they sending me away to boarding school? You know, and why aren't they worried about me being too clingy? But actually she's feeling, I don't want to join that tribe. I don't want to join any tribe. I, I just want to be, a, I want to exist in this wonderful free space that is part of all the disadvantages women have in this world. There are all kinds of advantages as well, like, like people not bothering you as much. And she's, she's finding out her free space and there isn't any free space for Hugh actually. So he, he needed to be the absolute point at which all the hurt in the book sort of strikes. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to Nikki again. Um, you know, in, uh, in, um, it's in the Charter House of Parma where Stendhal has um, Fabrice. And it's this great, I mean, it's the great moment in, I, where yeah. fiction, fiction writers have to decide, are you, yeah, Fabrice is on his horse. He's thinking about love and he really is in love. But there's also nearby something going on, which later will be called the Battle of Waterloo. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Fabrice may in fact have attended the Battle of Waterloo. Yes. And, but in this it's unclear. And every novelist has to decide, is your character at the Battle of Waterloo or is your character in love? And, and I think with Nicky, because he does go to these marches and um, I love there's a detail that, you know, you, 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 I, you probably came to you naturally, but I haven't read anyone, I haven't read the word ball bearing in a novel yes. because that is from the 60s. Because if you threw ball bearings on the ground, not that I ever did this, by the way, but if you did, the horses, the police horses, absolutely were destabilized because the ball bearing is really frightened the horses and you have yeah. ball bearings but yeah. what you what you could have in the next chapter is the description of nikki being arrested of nikki losing it for a second throwing a stone breaking a window and actually being held and then every the crisis being how to get nikki out of prison and you emphatically don't go there you give him he just comes home and, and he writes his article then you left review or wherever he wherever he writes it for but it, it but but the, but those 
big, big moments. The, you know, you don't have them going to a Rolling Stones concert and getting stoned at the concert. You know, there, there's big yeah. scenes that you bring. It's very interesting back. that, isn't it? I mean, it is partly because one knows you must, you, you must, I know you have the same thing. You, one sort of knows there are certain things you can't do. Then if I put a Rolling Stones concert, it would have sounded phony. It's, it's, isn't it funny? You just approach what you can do. And I don't really mean can do really as part of the sense of what the novelist's capacity is. I mean, the doability of that thing, that there are some things that aren't doable. They're going to sound phony. So, so I just... I, I did. I knew I needed a big scene, a big party, a big counterculture party. So, and I vaguely knew there had been some on the demolition site for the Westway. So, I, that's what I did in the end. But it was a kind of made-up affair, really. I couldn't. There are some things, especially when I mean, this you have dealt with this so much more in your James book and in your Man book. Where there is, there, there are the real events and happenings that you know about. And how, how, how are you going to make that alive? And what obliqueness can bring you to being able to put it on the page and make it sound fresh? And it's funny, there are certain, there are the, the best known things, are the, are, they yield up with the most difficulty, don't they? And one finds one's way in around the sides. Yes, that, that moving them back into, it is the Everglades, isn't it? The 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 the, the yeah. yeah. Yes, moving them back into this extraordinary building, which it really is is a live character in the book. You know, does the elevator? Where does it stop? How well does it go? The different floors, the different figures at the floors, like a chorus in the building. Yeah. The way the parties will be held with Liz arriving, the, the bitter poet, and Paul, yes. the sculptor, and you know all of them. You know that 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 the building operates um, as as a sort of society. I just want to go into, into one more. You know what we're talking about? I'm talking about the idea of building character in fiction and uh, offering the reader at the beginning a sort of blueprint. And then out of that, starting mm. work. Mm. Um, Colette is this, um, I mean, she's, she's a reasonably studious, reasonably quiet. She wears her uniform. I mean, she, she dis- despises some, but, but she really is a, a sort of very uneasy young, mm. you know, girl. And her mother simply departs. So one day there's a note and she finds it and her mother is gone. And you then have to work out what is she going to do? And it's lovely watching you because you, you're you pulling in two directions. In one way, yes, yeah, she goes and meets her friends in a pub. She makes even a pass at a younger brother, one of her friends. She goes slightly crazy. She goes to the park. You know, she, she, she um, d- doesn't go to school. And then she starts going to into her mother's world. Hmm. Um, and as you say, what's fascinating is that her mother doesn't see the world she's gone into. Which is basically free, free living, free, you know, free love, free, free, um, almost squatting, but not exactly. But they're all sixties people. They're all almost flower children, and the daughter comes in as as though she's from an older generation, and she mm. sees the thing in much more clearly than her mother does. And when she sees her mother, that her mother is pregnant, her mother never. It's a wonderful thing in the book. Her mother never worries about being pregnant. She never says, "Oh my God, I'm pregnant. What am I going to do?" I'm going to mm. live. She just feels joy, and she feels this is actually wonderful. I didn't think this was going to happen, mm. and she and she, and the, but the daughter sees oh, and the daughter sees almost everything as oh, but then the daughter gets seduced into it, but then goes back home to her father, and it becomes oddly enough her father's daughter. Yeah, which of course she's yeah. been her father's favorite child, mm. and now she becomes studious in the middle of the whole business mm. with her O levels coming up. She actually decides to be serious yeah. without abandoning it isn't as though she walks away from her mother and has nothing more to do with her with 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 Westburn Grove or with um Notting Hill she goes there too but she goes home so she, she's mm-hmm. living in the two worlds quite easily by by mm. the middle of the book mm-hmm. isn't so so there's a lot I, I just what I'm talking about you being intelligent I mean there's a lot of thought put into making her more credible I mean, not, not necessarily more credible, but more textured, more interesting, that she, she's ambiguous, she, that she's two people and that she's, she's unformed. And we're watching her as the ingredients in her emerge more strongly. Mm. And, and that is a space that's sort of made possible for her by being a girl, not a boy. 
If she had been a boy, she would have been sent away to that school. And instead, everybody takes their eye off her. And she has this because she's smart and brave. She has this free space where she can go to one thing and then do the other thing. And she can just keep both of them going. And I mean, I feel when she goes off to New York at the end, she's going to be, she's going to do such dangerous things. And yet she's going to be such an intellectual. And I, I feel she's the success story of the book. We don't know that. And she could be, you know, she could come a cropper, but I don't think she does. She's, she's, she is loving the moment, actually. She's loving this moment, yeah. which opens yeah, it, up. It, it, she is it, the it, true it, beneficiary. Yeah, that she's and, and maybe that man. says something about what happened, to, I think, to a lot of women in the 60s was that they, I mean, I'm, this is a grotesque generalisation, but let's do it, is that there, there was a sort of new role, and it's what Phyllis steps into, as a kind of earth mother, flower power thing, where you, you, you did stop wearing shoes and, and start cooking curries and, and sort of laughed at the bourgeoisie, but actually you, you were still shelling out babies and looking after the egos of the men, exactly what Phyllis sort of comes to do, drifting your way, sleeping around. It, it what took another 10 years, and in 10 years' time, Colette will be in her mid-20s, for women to be ferocious about making themselves new things in the world, new ways of being. So, so that's, in a way, I've, I've almost inscribed that bit of feminist history and the kind of, you know, it... it so many of the advantages of the sexual revolution in the 60s, it's a cliche, you know, were for the men. Yeah. There's a, there's a third woman um, in the book, and, and I think she really matters, and she anchors the book in certain ways in a changing London, a changing England, and also the fact that, that there is at the heart of it is a huge irresponsibility, a mm-hmm. sort of carelessness about things, because she always knows that she can go back home. Yeah. But there's yeah. a nurse. If you could just take us through the nurse mm-hmm. who's living in the building as part of this sort of, as I say, living society that's in this block of apartments called the Everglades. There's someone mm-hmm. else in the building who really is quite different to the others. She's Barbara and she's come from Grenada when the NHS sent out literally a call to what were then the, the Commonwealth and um, asking for workers to come and flood into the new NHS that was being developed after the war. And Barbara has come to do that and she's training as a nurse. She's obviously extremely clever, actually. So in some ways, if you like, her initial presence in the book could feel like Colette. And they they find a funny kind of friendship. It's not deep or big, but it's something. They they see each other, the the trainee nurse and the the clever schoolgirl. But everything is different because Colette can afford, as Phyllis, her mother, can afford to play with life, to take risks, to step off the diving board and see what happens. And Barbara can't. She's her, The education she's had so far, she, she tells Colette at some point, is because a male cousin died terribly as a little boy and therefore the family's money was after all spent. There were no more boys. She was sent to school and she went to school barefoot and walked four miles every day to get there. And so this this achievement of now being in London and being a nurse, though she doesn't like London very much and she doesn't like nursing very much, but there's nothing else. There's no free choice to step out into around it. There's an economic political necessity f- behind her yes. pushing her onwards and there's a point where she and Colette are actually both revising for exams side by side and Colette knows that again she's she's messing around and actually she she's sort of made up her mind to try and get good marks because why wouldn't you but Barbara these are gateways across her future that she needs to push open with all her effort to get through them and she does have this dream and it's she and Phyllis, Barbara and Phyllis are telling each other their dreams at some point. And Phyllis, Phyllis's are all of emotion and family and love. And Barbara has a dream of being in an office with her name on the door and papers and books on the shelves. She's seen it somewhere in a photograph. And, and I, I wanted to convey how desirable that power 
that authority, that dignity of self might be to, to somebody like Barbara. And I, I'm actually, I feel she'll do it. She'll be an important figure in nursing, actually. I mean, I shouldn't speculate beyond the end of the novel, though strangely, I did find myself with this novel asking I mean, it's, oh, oh, yes, you do want to know. Uh, because yeah. what you've done with her is, is, is what I was talking about earlier. I, I mean, let's just talk about it as a sort of fictional intelligence where, yes, she's, 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 an, she's an incredibly kind person. And as you say, she really has, you know, she, she has to work. But mm. you don't make her into a born nurse who's kind yeah. and who loves patients. She actually yeah. is someone who really wants to write or wants to read, wants to know the world. She, she wants mm. to, she could read philosophy. That there's something else she will want to do. But also yeah. you, put in, you, you just give the racism, you make it casual. You know, it's just part of her life. She just says, yeah, well, obviously, if you're, if, if you're not a white nurse, you get to Yes, we've done the jobs that white nurses want to do. Yeah. And the they other wanted her to, to wear a grass skirt in the uh, pantomime yeah. for Christmas. Oh, to wearing the grass skirt at the pantomime, yeah. so that you know, which, the, I, which the, I I read somewhere about that happening to somebody. Well, yeah. I mean, once more, there 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 are levels. Um, I was wondering if you could read us one more um, section, and then I want to talk to you about the construction, the sort of structure of the book. And this is, I was talking about that big party and my, my, my knowledge that I needed a big, great, crazy carnival somewhere to really fulfill the counterculture part of the novel. So this, this is Colette um, at a great big happening, it would have been called, wouldn't it? A happening on, on the demolished sort of flat ground where the Westway is going to be built in the future. She's there with her school friend, Susan, who's incredibly sort of straight and has been a netball champion, but is sort of tasting wildness for the first time. Grabbing Susan's hand so as not to lose her, Colette pulled her away into the crowd. She was disappointed in the first minutes they were left alone, anonymous among the walls of turned backs and the closed circles of friends swaying and partying together. They were in the mass, but not of it. And even though she felt invisible, she was afflicted with self-consciousness. The smell of pot was everywhere. Everyone was smoking or high apart from them. Boldly, she stopped a guy wearing beads and waving a joint around. He handed it over. Peace and love, girls, he actually said. They passed it back and forth between them. And as the pot took hold, something loosened in Susan that had been fixed and tightly wound. She gave one barking laugh threw her head back and shook it as if she were clearing it, and then led the way, shoving and dodging between strangers, dragging Colette after her, out in front of the scar band where people were dancing. Her dancing style was peculiar for someone who'd been so graceful in netball. Absorbed, frowning, stooped as if she were watching her own feet, shaking her fists not quite in time to the beat, boy scout lanyard flying in all directions. It seemed a dedicated and private ritual, she didn't need anyone to dance with. Nonetheless, a guy began dancing opposite her, following her moves, skinny and white with his shirt unbuttoned, spirals and peace signs drawn in grease paint on his bare chest. Susan acknowledged him with a glance and a brusque nod. Love the dress, he shouted. Can I call you Queenie? Stately, she granted him permission. Colette jogged uneasily up and down beside them for a while. No one came to dance with her and she felt herself shut out from the scar beat, its invitation to pleasurable abandon. Perhaps she didn't have abandon in her body, only this stiff, clumsy resistance. Even Susan, Susan Smithfield knew better than she did how to submit to it. When she mentioned the last train, Susan only shrugged. I'll come back to find you later, Colette said but she thought that her friend hardly heard her. Making her way alone through the crowd, she felt more free, although also more frightened. Instead of lifting her above the scene, the pot made her feel lost inside it. She thought that individuals pushing past her, not seeing her, had faces as marked and haggard as masks or a light with sly purpose, audacious. Some seemed to come from a different world than anyone she'd met at her mother's. These weren't middle-class rebels. They were more like gypsy wanderers or adepts in a secret street life at home in this underworld. And yet her own mother also belonged here. Everyone else knew how to be carried along in this turbulent river. 
while Colette watched from the dry land of herself. She felt the river's pull and its powerful romance, along with its terror, but didn't know how to let herself into it. A dirty white swollen moon rose above the waste ground and shed its pallid light on the scene. She stood listening to the broken music of the jazz band. To steady herself, she rehearsed in her mind the order in which German states had joined the customs union, the Zolverein. Is it you? Someone said from beside her. It was Paul, the sculptor whom she'd first met in Nicky's room. Aren't you the child who came looking for Phil P Fisher? Are you allowed to be out here on your own? <laughs> uh, we, we were talking about um, intelligence, about simply thinking through, if you have a character, what should the character do? How should the character be? How much ambiguity will the character bear? And um, how the, the battle is against the idea of a singleness in the way a character mm. functions. And um, the, the, I want to talk now about the idea of structure. And I want to say that if you were, if someone said to you, you know, if I was going to write, what should I look at? What should I do? And I said, well, just look at free love because there's something that happens structurally, technically in the middle of the book that is a lesson to us all. And I, th I think part of it comes from the great tradition, which is um, that we don't, in Middlemarch, we don't see Dorothea and Casabon just after their marriage. We don't know what happens on the, you know, on, on the first month of their marriage. We just don't see it. Isabel Archer, we don't see the same thing exactly in Portrait of a Lady mm. when she's with Osmond first. Mm. So that idea of not including something, of not dramatizing something, of leaving a blank space in a novel can be very, very powerful if you have the tact to show what's going on around it as containing the thing that's not included. It, it's there as undercurrent, it's there as palpable absence. So you have this amazing moment where, well, big, big chunk of the book, really, where she has gone. I mean, and Phyllis has gone to London. She left a note. She's gone. So obviously we want to know well, what happened when she went. I mean, what door did she knock? How is she receiving? How is she living now? Time is passing. We don't. And instead, of course, we're getting Christmas. And, and this is where we can deal with Hugh, her, you know, her son, because it's going to be about his boy still wants his presents for Christmas and he wants his stocking filled in those usual way it's filled and his mother does this and of course it's a question of food and of course it's a question of, of you know the father missing you know, everything is missing at mm. Christmas because she's not there and so we watch and we watch and we watch and we realize I wonder where she is I wonder what she's doing and then um, what you can do um and that's the difference between, you know, you, you, and, you and everybody else, really, is that you can hold this, your tact, your actual sense of what's interesting and how long you can hold it for is really brilliant. It's really extraordinary. You, you know, give it another few pages because actually it can hold it. You know, our, our the tension of where is Phyllis? What's she doing? can be held longer. Don't give in to an easy temptation to, to cut to her soon. Cut her in a while, bring, bring it on further. And again, I suppose this is really about what I would call the sort of sensuous thinking, the sort of thinking as a fiction writer as to how much you need mm -hmm. information to give and how much you need to withhold. And, and it, isn't, it isn't very calculating, is it? It's, it no, is no, sensuous. No, no. It is as yes. you're doing it, you're feeling, if you like, the, the, the elastic stretching and stretching, and then a point at which ah, oh, you're actually just going to be annoying people if you don't put it there. But you've got to be thinking about the reader, haven't you? But in a very complicated way, you're not always anxious about the reader. But you're, you're, you hope you're giving pleasure in a way, aren't you? And that's what you're doing when you pull it out a long way and then you, and then you relax it. I didn't, what I did, and it was, this was quite fun to do. And I, cut, I have no memory of, of a sequence of choices, but I... What I didn't do, I, I didn't tell you about Phyllis arriving in the middle of the night in Nikki's room when she's left, and that's it, she's here. I didn't tell in the right order. I actually, we cut to her after a few days in the room with him, and then I have him, I have Nikki thinking about it at the end of that chapter sort of so, so I slightly disrupt the order there I, I can sort of I can sort of think what I mean in a way ha, 
after that little game I've played, it's not a game, but that holding off I've done, it would have then seemed very odd temporarily to have then said, you know, Phyllis arrived at his door and she and we'd think, oh, no, we're a week before. We're a week after that. That's already happened. We can't make that jump backwards. So you, you, you're you holding all kinds of not rules, but contracts with the reader that you won't mess up and you won't cheat them and you won't confuse them. Actually, at moments like that, you do have to have a little bit of a little sense of, so that's a few days there and a few days there, and then he's been there a week. And you can kind of, you, you use that timetable. Yes, it's fascinating that, I mean, I presumed what you were going to do was say what happens in, say, Joseph Conrad's Victory. You, you know, where, where various time spans overlap, mm. you get the story told twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, from two different sides. I presume yeah. it's going to go, when Phyllis, left home that day she realized she had not taken her toothbrush yeah which you could do you, of course there is a license to do that yes that the and, reader then is taken back yeah yes and so yeah. I'm, I'm expecting this to come at any moment i'm turning each page i'm reading about christmas but at any moment now but you don't do it you actually yeah. as you say you play with it you, you 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 what you do is you trust the reader's intelligence to know that the reader's already imagined this the reader's already ahead of this mm. And you know what else I suspect that I thought we've been a lot in Phyllis's head thus far in the book. And we kind of know what that moment when she erupts in the middle of the night into his room in the Everglade. We know what that's going to feel like to her. But what we don't know and what would be rich to put on the page is what it will feel like to Nicky, who's totally taken aback. He's, you know, he thinks he's got this rather cool affair going on. And suddenly this woman has brought her life yes. to him. But once more, he's taken it back, but he, he doesn't respond negatively. I mean, it isn't as though no. he puts her out or, you know, no. he, he's, he's again, once more, we're talking about that sort of ambiguity of response. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah. if, I, um, if I wrote this sentence um, using Kafka as my source, um, that Tessa Hadley woke one morning from uneasy dreams and thought she'd rather like to write a version of Oedipus. Would that, would that be true? Would, would there be any truth in that? Well, do you know that I thought about Phaedra and Hippolytus with this one? And by saying that, I am nudging around the little secret that the novel has up its sleeve, which we haven't, we're quite rightly... No, we're not going to, no, we're not, we're not going to. Away. But I, I mean, there are the... Yes, Oedipus definitely <laughs> there somewhere. Yeah, and aren't those stories just great? Those stories can be endlessly reused, thank goodness for them. And the novel I'm writing now, I, I suddenly thought, oh, what about what happens in Mansfield Park? That would be good. So, you know, it, and we can do that. It's lovely. There's a um, score of stories. It has an undercurrent in the story, which I think gets a sort of power by the end, is an elegiac love story that's been mm. there all along if we could only have mm. seen it. Um, but, 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 but that you know is there. And do, do you know all along as you're working that I you knew that this one. a love story to tell that's going to really emerge as, as again, it's a war story, yeah. it's a doomed love, but but it's still palpable, it's still present. And of course, it explains everything. The, yeah. the beginning with that love affair. Yeah, yeah. I knew I knew from the beginning that that was I is very odd with this novel. It all sort of fell into my lap at once. That doesn't usually happen. And, and in, there are about six pages in my notebook in which pretty much the whole thing is scribbled out. Although, interestingly, with what you've been talking about, um, the characters are a bit thinner, you know, because they haven't been written yet. They haven't done anything, so they haven't thickened. So they're, they're a little bit more stereotyped. But, but, but it, basically, the story is there. Yeah, I... I I loved having two, two worlds side by side. In one world, you have one kind of love affair and it has this flavor. And in another world, you have this kind of love affair and it has this flavor. I, I'm, I'm such an anti-essentialist. I really don't think love is the same in 1750 and 1850 and 1950. I think most of how we experience the world is is in the is in the flavor of the particular context the, the the minute we live in the decade we live in and there are drives and of course we can read shakespeare or for that matter 
um, Sophocles. And, and of course, we're all human and we absolutely recognise that old story and we're close to it. So, so it, isn't, it isn't that there aren't threads, strong, essential threads of commonality running through it all. But most of what's fascinating is particular and local and parochial, actually. What, what do you think about it? Do you think that's true? Um, I think that um, what we're talking about here, I mean, I'm, I'm accepting what you're saying, of course, um, but that the point is then that you capture the novel at a moment when the tectonic plates are moving. In other mm. words, that there are two kinds of love mm. available in 1967 and 68. Yeah. Yeah. And what you're doing is you're actually dramatizing how one yeah. gives way to the other. Yeah. And so it isn't just merely uh, as saying, oh, love was different then. You say no. Love was lo love was uh, was a shimmering business where it, it couldn't be pinned down. You couldn't say what was love in 1967. Oh well, if you were in the suburbs, it was this, and if you were, happened to be in Westbourne Grove, it was that. So, you, so you're actually capturing um, a time. I mean, it'd be like capturing a moment when you know marriages were arranged, and then yeah. where some marriages suddenly yeah. were not, and yeah. someone is caught between the arrangement and the actual you know making making your own choices so it's it's that so mm. I, I which is which is pretty much what what tony tanner i think rightly says the whole of the 19th century novel is built around that conflict between the arranged contractual marriage and the and love romantic love and yes. what a brilliant source that was for about 150 years at least yes. of of fantastic novels whichever way they took it Yes, but you're finding a moment um, in the 20th century where yeah. actually the same yeah. sort of conflicts are going on within yeah. a single individual. Yes. Um, and uh, I mean, what's really interesting is Phyllis is so freed, so mm. free, mm. and so suddenly and so ready for it mm. that mm. it isn't as though she mm. worries about who will be the father of my son. No, and, and I do you know, I actually think that moment of freedom, it did pass. As in a way it should do, because it was profoundly irresponsible, but no one knew that then. It felt as if you were stepping into a better world. Huge illusion, if you like, but a huge dream of, of being able to choose and be happy. And I think the generations that followed, you know, they were living, they were the children of those choices and they were living with the consequences of that. And, and in a way, responsibility settled back down on everybody's shoulders. Yeah. I, I, I've met those women, those wonderful women who did that mad thing and stepped out into the into the river, if you like, and, and stayed with it. And yeah. they're now old ladies and they're great. They're amazing. Uh, so that love, free love is a sort of ironic title as much as it's a... Yeah, it's a, it's yeah. A, of course, of it's, course, it's, yes. yes. Yeah. Um, Tessa, th th thank you very much for this conversation. This, this was marvellous to talk to you, but it was even more marvellous, I have to say, to read the book. I got nothing but pleasure from it. And I learned a great deal, not only about the period, but actually about the business of structure in a novel. And if anyone wants to re read a novel, which is so beautifully made and so intelligently made, read Free Love and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And thank oh, you very much. Um, as always, I can't think of anybody I'd rather talk to. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, let's talk again soon. <laughs>